So this is our next speaker. His name is Zeshan, correct? Zishan. Zishan? Zishan? Yeah. So hard today. Uh, <laughs> he's going to talk about rust memory management and types and memory safety. Um, I guess you can start. Introduce okay. yourself and that's all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I wasn't expecting this many people. <laughs> so, like, there were four people because it's 10 in the morning. Um, but yeah, th thanks for coming. Um, I, uh, my name is Zishan. I uh, work at a company, small company in uh, Berlin called Kinfolk. Uh, it's a for hire Linux expertise company, mostly I work around uh, Kubernetes and stuff, uh, and container technologies. Um, and um, I've been. Uh, Fond of Rust for a long time, ever since it was first um, uh, introduced. Uh, it was pretty unstable, so nobody could use it. But lately, I have been uh, using it, uh, especially now also at work a bit. Um, so um, yeah, I wanted to introduce uh, memory management, because a lot of people, uh, when they come across the, uh, this new language, they, they stumble with it. At least I did. I was uh, really having a hard time with the memory aspect of it. So it's good to have an introduction to that. Um, so um, how many of you know essential Rust, like some, some of it? OK, quite many. So I, do, I won't get into a lot of details anyway, but I'll just quickly uh, introduce the aspects that I'll use later in the examples. Um, well, mainly it's like a system programming language. So it's there, um, some programming languages, they ensure safety. Some programming languages ensure efficiency. But with Rust, you have both of them at the same time. There, there is a focus on both of these things um, in the design of the language. Um, so it makes it a really, really awesome language, uh, in my opinion. And um, you have a co concept of zero cost abstractions. Um, so everything you code in, in Rust, um, you, it will be have e equivalent um, um, performance as it w if you write it in C or C++. Uh, actually, uh, Sebastian, he's in the queue outside, I think. Um, he's not here, right? Um, he's uh, working on GStreamer. Uh, he's writing GStreamer uh, plugins and elements in, in Rust. And he actually saved uh, a lot of uh, CPU. He um, made, it, uh, made the code uh, perform much better, because in Rust, you can, you can achieve it m more easily. Um, because of the zero cost abstractions that we have in Rust. Um, it has a non mutable state by default. Uh, so if you want to uh, mark something as uh, mutable, you have to use a keyword. So when you have a problem in your code base, so you can you know which uh, variables and which parameters to, to look for. Uh, because if uh, it's a non mutable state, you, it won't give you any problem because it doesn't change. So why would it? Uh, uh, pro create a problem. Uh, so it's a mut uh, mutable state that you need to look for, and that's why it's uh, by default you have uh, everything non-mutable. Um, and it has strict ownership semantics. Um, in C and C++, uh, you uh, usually uh, just give a pointer to someone, and then uh, you have to establish some sort of uh, way to um, make sure that Nobody double freeze it, or um, especially in C, we have like, uh, like uh, we have been using in GNOME uh, glib libraries for uh, reference counting all objects. So um, you have to handle that manually in C, of course. But in um, Rust, you don't have to do that manually. Uh, but you have to think about how ownership works. And um, um, at one time, there can be only one owner uh, to a resource. Um, I'll, I'll show it uh, examples later how that is. Um, so we will start with a simple example. Um, in, an other, in other um, programming languages, something like this. Um, you're passing an um, array um, vector to, um, uh, to a function, and it's just adding two first two elements of that and returning it. And in many languages, this would just work fine. But um, uh, you add that, uh, and then you show it, and it's fine. But um, in Rust, this won't work because um, when you, as it says, um, when you passed the vector there, you passed the ownership to that function. And you never get, got that ownership back. So later on, you can't use the, the, the resource that you already passed to it because you gave it the ownership. And the main thing is there are two kinds of uh, types in, in Rust. Uh, there's copy types, and then there's move types. 
Um, by copy types, there is um, the um, simple types in, in Rust, for example, integers and booleans and those kind that uh, can be passed around like as copies without any performance problems, um, easily copied. Uh, those always get copied. So when you pass it to a function, if in the, in the example, if I was passing integers directly, that example would have worked because it's a copy type. Um, but uh, move types, um, which are most of the types uh, by default, you create your own data type, it will be by default a move type. Um, and by move, I don't mean the whole thing moving, but moving of ownership. So you give the ownership to someone else when you pass it to them, if you pass by, by value and you can't use it anymore. Um, and that's, as I said, uh, in Rust, uh, by default, everything has only and only one, um, every resource has only one owner at a time in the code. Um, so it's very clear, and it, uh, then Rust so knows where, when to free the resource and when not to. Um, but the thing is, you can't, you can't work like that. You have to you know, have multiple ownership, um, owners and stuff. And one of the first ways to do it, and one of the most obvious and most used is uh, borrowing, uh, which is like in C++ and C++ plus by reference, more like C++. Um, so the same example, we just turned the parameter into a reference. Um, so when you pass it by reference, you are... Um, borrowing the ownership of that resource to that function you're calling temporarily. And once that scope in which it's borrowed, that's over, then the borrowing is finished and you have the, your resource back. Um, but if I had kept the uh, ownership, if I, for example, if I had set m percent v and then assign it to a local variable, it has the same scope as v then, and then I could not have used it while it's still borrowed. So while it's borrowed, you cannot use it, but once the borrowing is finished, which is based on scopes. Um, and the scope in this case is the, the fu that function that you called. So when it returns, you got the ownership back. Uh, everyone following so far? Or <laughs> I have 20 minutes to explain this very complicated subject, so I'm trying my best. Um, but the problem with borrows is, as I said, it's temporary. You, you get it back. And uh, the resource that borrowed it, you can't keep it forever. And you don't have the ownership at the same time uh, Exactly. Um, so we will, we will start with an example. Um, I fly helicopters, so uh, I, <laughs> my examples are <laughs> related to that. Um, so um, you have a registration. Every aircraft has a registration, so it's a simple struct. And um, I have an implementation for it. It's just a constructor. Um, get a registration as a string. Um, this string type is an owned string type, so you, uh, it's, um, it's, there's two string types in Rust. One is the owned, one is not owned. Uh, the non-owned is, is a borrow. It's a piece of the string, uh, which could be the whole uh, string itself as well, but it's a borrow. But this string with a capital S is a, um, is the owned type. So um, we, from main, we uh, pass it uh, a string, an owned string, um, and then we want to just use it there. And then after we pass it to the heli, the struct constructor, we again use it ourselves. And that won't work because when we pass by value, we gave it the ownership. So as you, like last time saw, it's very similar. Or actually, it's the same, just different context. You move the value, and you can't use it anymore. So what would we do in this case? The, the, the easiest solution is to use a data type called RC. Um, uh, which is abbreviation for reference counting. Um, and what it does, it's a container type, which um, you, you put something in it, and it adds reference counting to that resource. Um, so the resource itself, you don't need to copy it around if you want to pass it around and have multiple owners in the, in the same code of the same resource. And instead, you just use RC. And what it does is, like, each time you create a new user for it, um, you increase the reference count on, on that resource, uh, contained resource. And then once your, all these scopes are um, finished that have, borrowed, that have increased the reference count, um, Rust automatically um, de destroys the resource, the underlying resource, because now there is no owners for it. So um, it's just like any reference counting in any programming languages you must have seen. Um, so in this case, we just we do it exactly the same, but instead of passing the string directly, we now put it in a RC 
and pass the RC's clone method. So by clone, I created a new um, refer reference count. I increased the reference count on it. So that when it goes to that one, then when uh, the new function, it keeps the ownership. So now we have two owners of the same resource. So when I said in the beginning that you can only have one uh, owner at a time, I kind of lied, but not exactly, because uh, you really can't have two owners, but Rust provides you ways of working around it in a safe way. Uh, in other programming languages, you just you can just really nearly pass things around and ownership. Um, they can there can be multiple owners, and the language have no way of testing if um, uh, you will destroy the resource while another uh, part of the code is still using that resource. Uh, but in Rust, since you put it in RC, um, Rust ensures that uh, the resource is always there as long as there is a, a, a user of that resource. Um, Sir, clone is not a real clone. Uh, no, it's clone not. It's a. It's a. Yeah, it's in this case. It just increases the reference count. Um, good question. <laughs> um, but the problem is RCT is not for multiple threads. Um, if I run this, for example, now I introduce. It's the same example as previously, almost, except this time I have added a method and I'm calling that method from a, another thread. So I launch another thread to call that method, and uh, now multiple threads are using the same uh, RC, um, which we have RC in the, in the struct. So this one will end up in an error, uh, something like this. Uh, Rust have uh, these uh, traits, uh, concept of traits, and different structs uh, implement different traits. Um, and that's how it um, ensures um, that um, uh, different guarantees are, are met. Um, and in this case, there is a trait called send that uh, needs to be implemented by structs if they want to be accessible by different threads. Um, so we need a different uh, struct uh, which implements that trait that Rust needs if you want to access it from different threads. And that uh, struct uh, we have in the uh, STD, in the, in the standard library, is ARC. Um, it's just atomic reference counting. So the reference count is, uh, is atomic in this case. It's very similar to the RC. Uh, the main thing is that it's uh, thread safe. So instead of RC, I, I use ARC. And the same example, it's same code, will, will just work. Um, yeah. Um, but the problem with uh, then RC is that it's not, uh, it's, uh, sorry, ARC is, not, is that it's not mutable. Um, so you can't like get a resource out of it and then modify it. Um, that's not uh, possible. So um, let's look at example. So this time it's the same exact uh, code again, uh, except that in the hover uh, method now we are modifying the resource. And um, this uh, the the methods I'm calling is just the normal methods of the string type. Um, clearing the string and then pushing another string on on the existing string, um, but this this won't work because I'm modifying it. Um, and the main thing is I can't borrow it as mutable because it's not a mutable resource. I didn't mark it as one either. Um, so for those things, you need yet another uh, data structure called mutex, um, which is just like a mutex in a, a, any programming languages and libraries. Uh, you get locks on the resource. Um, so we put arc uh, mutex in an arc because we want to access it from multiple threads atomic, uh, with atomic reference counting. So the arc is adding atomic reference counting. And then the mutex is ensuring that you can um, have mutable locks on, on the resource. Um, so you have multiple container types. You, you will see that in sometimes in Rust, you, you need to have multiple containers. Uh, to the same resource, uh, but the thing is you have uh, type aliasing, so you can use that to create a new type for your complex type very, very easily, and that's just an uh, alias, so it makes things pretty easy uh, to follow. Um, anyway, so this time you just uh, use uh, mutex, so you, uh, um, you create, like when you created the arc, you in, in there you just do a new mutex and put the resource in the mutex. Uh, but in the hover, uh, you need a you, you take a lock of the um, of the from the mutex, 
Um, and when you access the mutex, it's, since it's uh, contained in ARC, you, uh, you get an atomic reference. So you, um, uh, it's a thread safe. Um, and once you get the, the lock, you, then you can do whatever you want because you have gotten yourself a mutic, mutable reference to the, to the resource. Um, and then uh, the thing is that um, Rust is very much, the memory management is very much based on scopes. So once you uh, are out of that scope, which is the hover method, uh, the lock that you acquired will be freed automatically for you. So you don't have to uh, free it. If you want to, uh, as far as I know, there is an unlock method. Um, but you, usually you don't need to. You just um, use scopes to, to, to uh, signal like that, OK, I'm done with the, with the lock. Um, and similar to uh, uh, the uh, uh, mutex, there is a type called read-write lock, which is if you have multiple threads that um, some of them needs only read access, not write access. So it, it could be uh, very inefficient if you, have, if, you're, if you use mutex because every thread will have to wait for the other thread to uh, finish uh, access and then be able to access. But the read-write lock, you can have m multiple readers of the same resource. So multiple uh, 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 threads can um, can lock on the same uh, resource at the same time uh, as a read read lock, but not write lock. So, but if there is a thread ex uh, having a write lock, then others have to wait for for that to finish. Um, yeah, it's very similar. Um, I'm I'm really sorry. I'm going really fast, but um, I, I have very little time, as I mentioned. Um, so. Box is uh, is a type um, when you when you usually ac uh, create a resource you put it usually on the stack and um, but if you use those um, uh, data structures that I mentioned uh, RC ARC and those um, you put it on the heap but um, it's um, it's more heavy um, RC is, has a reference counting and it needs to ensure that the reference count increases decreases blah 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 um, so. Uh, you don't want to use it just for allocating on the heap. So if you want to just allocate something on the heap to pass it around while, uh, and keep the, um, uh, the resource around for, for longer than one function or something, uh, you can use something called box. And um, you, it's very simple. You just create a new box. And uh, the 5 in there is not the size. People think of it as size. But that's just an integer that I want to keep in the box. And then you just use it like as if it's not contained in a box. Uh, it's it's like usable like as if it was just the integer itself, um, just like in our case of RC and ARC. Um, another thing with the box is uh, very important is that it gives uh, the resource it keeps a size. Um, so if, for example, this case in Rust, uh, you your enums can be complex. You can have uh, data inside. Uh, your enums, um, particular enums. Uh, so in this case, we want to create a list uh, that is uh, have other um, uh, nodes in it. Um, so um, we want to keep a list in a list. Um, and you, we can't do that, because Rust won't be able to tell how much uh, memory to allocate to this, because um, you know it's infinite recursion. Um, we can break that infinite recursion by using box. Because box the list that if it's um, it's going to be a list it's uh, on the on the heap and you only get a pointer in the box and pointer is always the same size so you solve the problem and without using any pointers itself um, in in Rust you can use pointers especially in unsafe code when you mark it as unsafe but uh, typically you can avoid it and you should avoid it uh, because um, that's where the problems are usually. Um, yeah, I wanted to discuss briefly the lifetimes, and that was another reason I was uh, uh, hurrying up. I have done the same talk uh, before in other conferences, but I always avoid lifetimes. So this is my first time <laughs> addressing it. I hope I can uh, do some justice to it, because it's, uh, uh, people are afraid of it. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, you can, you can pass things by reference, and references are. Um, Temporary, um, and they, the scopes define the lifetimes of things. Um, so in this case, you get two strings uh, in the longest function. It just returns the longest string you have. I'm sorry, I have my pointer here. 
And um, so this should work, right? Because you just pass the references, you get the reference to the longest string, and yeah. Um, but it wouldn't work because um, Rust doesn't know when, and you get uh, helpful, very helpful messages uh, nowadays from, from Rust compiler, so that's, that's really cool. Um, so you borrowed a value, and then you return a reference to one of the borrowed values, and Rust doesn't know, well, he can easily, can't easily tell which, which one it is. And you have multiple uh, in parameters and one out parameter. So in, in this case, <coughs> you have to uh, tell it um, how long would the reference that you're returning um, uh, have to be kept alive, and what other resources it is uh, associated with. So it keeps them both alive um, uh, long enough. Um, so we can, I know the, the syntax of uh, lifetimes is, is a bit, uh, takes a while to get used to, and even when you get used to it, you still hate it, <laughs> but uh, that's how it is. I don't, I have no better suggestions, so I, I don't criticize much, uh, but I know that it's, it seems really, really weird. Um, so you, you declare in the function definition a, a lifetime. Uh, it's an abstract concept of the lifetime. So and you declared that all the uh, all the resources uh, that you're using, like the uh, in, input parameters and the return value, have the same exact lifetime, um, which means to tell to compiler, Rust compiler, that um, if you uh, if a uh, s1, s2, and, and the return value needs to be kept alive together, so you can't it can't free, uh, for example, the s1 that is being passed before uh, the usage of the return value is finished, or uh, the same with S2. Um, so in, in here, in the example, we, um, sorry, um, we pass the two values, and then we get the reference back. And this time, it's, it, the, the usage is exactly the same as we, we had in the previous uh, example. It's just that we now told Rust um, what are the association of the different lifetimes involved. Um, and the lifetimes are more like declarative than instructive, so it's like um, you give hint to the compiler, and it's up to the compiler how it handles those. You just tell it like these resources are related. Don't free them before you free others. Um, yeah, actually, that's all I had. So I think I have a lot of time for questions, and that's a good thing. <laughs> Okay. Can I ask a question to the previous slide? Um, Do you want me to move to the previous slide? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you say that you control the lifetime of the object that you can pass when the function is already over. In this example, uh, if S1 is returned, S1 has to be kept alive, but S2 don't, doesn't have to be. Uh, can you express that? Um, not exactly. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm not used to it, so <laughs> uh, no, I, I was told to repeat the question. Uh, the question is that um, uh, there is a case where S1 is, um, um, is to be returned and not S2, and in that case, we don't care about S2 anymore, and it's the S1 that, uh, that can't be freed while the return value is still well, uh, around. Um, that's true, um, but it's very hard for compiler to... Uh, to uh, find these out. One thing I did not mention is that um, in Rust you have something called lifetime elision. Like the one of the uh, code that you saw earlier where um, I was using references, but you noticed that there was no uh, lifetimes involved there. And the reason was that lifetimes are always there, except that in many cases, uh, at least the simple cases, Rust is smart enough to detect, okay, the compiler and it declares them for you in the code, so you don't have to care for them. But it's like a bit complicated uh, um, examples like these, then you will start to, when you have multiple references being passed and then you have uh, return as a reference as well, then Rust will get, uh, would not know how to handle that. Because it, it can handle it on its own, um, but uh, not through the lifetime syntax. It's like, because it's more dynamic, like we don't know which one, the which, uh, string that will be passed is uh, is going to be longest, so it's it's more like a dynamic decision, 
and Rust does all all things statically, so it needs to um, it needs to do it this way. But if you can't express that one of them has to stay alive and the other one doesn't have to, if you can't express that, then the compiler might just as well uh, keep alive every parameter always. No, you 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 can have multiple lifetimes. That's true, but um, in this case, you you need both of them because you don't know uh, before. Uh, you know which parameters will be passed because it's more dynamic thing like um, you don't know it when you're compiling just that function uh, let's say in a library um, and it will be used uh, by people you don't know <laughs> and you don't know what will be passed so uh, it will you will only know dynamically which uh, which case will it be so that's why it's it's not possible no other questions no. How do you specify different lifetimes? Do you use a different methods? Um, you uh, put like in, in there, in this example, you, uh, you have like uh, uh, lifetime A. You just put a comma, lifetime B. So you can declare multiple, and then you can use them like the same as the I'm using A lifetime. Uh, sorry, the, the question was uh, <laughs> if I can have multiple uh, lifetimes uh, in there. And that's what I answered. Uh, sorry. Uh, who that for? Uh, the question is if the lifetime is part of the reference type. Yeah. Uh, not exactly, um, but it's always there. Like when you pass uh, things by reference, um, the life, there's a lifetime involved. It, it just, the, the difference is whether you, you, you declare, you have to declare it or not. So it's separate. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's implemented through something called generics in, in, in Rust. Um, if you look into generics, uh, you will see that the, uh, uh, syntax of declaring them exactly li exactly the same, and that's how it's implemented. Uh, and you might want to read up on that. It's it's pretty interesting stuff how lifetimes are implemented. And, uh, last question. In multi-threaded code, uh, is it possible to have uh, functions that uh, override each other's lifetimes? So we have an object that well, not override, that uh, they have some kind of uh, collision. So one function. Accessing the same resource. Uh, so that the the question is, if I understood correctly, is that if the in multi-threaded application, is it possible for one thread to override the other yeah, is, uh, resource is, of is others? Is there a risk of one function no. with the lifetimes of the other? No, no. Life, you you can't really mess up with lifetime. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are you sure? Yeah, <laughs> okay. <sorry. laughs> no worries. Thank you very much. Yeah. No worries. Thank you.